our lives as he was in the lives of the people who were involved in the birth of our Savior. So there is a spirit of Christmas, and he is the Holy Spirit. Now, those of you that have been around for a little while, like three years ago, I preached a, a series called The Spirit of Christmas. We're going to take a little different twist, a little different direction than we did then, because we're going to look at how can we walk in the spirit of Christmas, and more importantly, how can we do that, uh, not just between Thanksgiving and December 25th, but how can we do this every day of our lives? And so we turn to Luke chapter 2 first of all, to see the Spirit's involvement in Christmas, the Spirit of Christmas, and see how that applies to us today. Luke chapter 2 and verse 25 says this, At that time there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was a righteous and devout, he was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. Now I want to stop right here and look at this last line. The Holy Spirit was upon him. The Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, this is eight days after Christ was born. They brought him to the temple to be dedicated, to be named, to be circumcised. And, and, and so this is after the birth of Christ. I told you we're going to kind of work backwards. But I wanted to stop here and point this out. Do you realize that if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ, then you have the Holy Spirit upon you as well? Just like Simeon, we have something in relation in, in uh, we have something in common with Simeon right now in that he had the Holy Spirit upon him, and so do we as believers. Romans said, Paul said in the book of Romans that if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Christ is not upon you, then you're not one of His. And so the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. He, is, he seals us. He, he marks us as His own. So when we get saved, when we commit our lives to Him, then He seals us with His Holy Spirit. So in a very literal sense, then, then the Holy Spirit is upon us in the same way He was upon Simeon 2,000 years ago. Now, but I want to see, I want to show you another step that Simeon took. In verse 26, look at what happened. And, and the, the Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day the Spirit led him to the temple. That day the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there and he took the child in his arms and he praised God and said, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you promised. I have seen your salvation which you have prepared for your people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations and he is the glory of your people Israel. Here's the distinction that I want to draw for you this morning. It is one thing to have the Spirit upon you. It is, it is quite another thing to be led by His Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you understand the distinction? It, it, there, is, there is a difference between being marked by His Spirit as, as belonging to Christ and being led by the Spirit. So if we're going to walk in the Spirit of Christmas, if we are going to walk in the Spirit of God, then we have got to learn to walk in a way that we are led by the Spirit. You say, well, John, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the distinction. Well, what's the difference in being led by the Spirit and just having the Spirit upon you? Well, I think maybe the difference can be, uh, can be described as the difference between kinetic energy and potential energy. Can we flash all the way back to physical science? Y'all remember that? You're like 13 and worried about your Nike, your pony tennis shoes or whatever you're wearing at the time. In physical science, it taught us the difference between kinetic energy and potential energy. Potential energy is like in a battery. You can go and grab a battery. Now, it's heavy, but you can grab a battery and you can carry that thing around with you all day long, but nothing different is going to happen in your life simply because you have the battery with you. All, there's lots of energy in it, lots of power in it, but there's, unless you connect to the power source, unless you connect it to other things, nothing is going to happen. It is only potential energy. However, when you, when you take out the, the wires that you need to, to, to uh, electrify, if you use your jumper cables and, or you connect your, your battery cables to your, from your car to that battery, then you will see that, that that potential energy turns into kinetic energy. It's energy in motion. It's energy that actually accomplishes something. 
So the difference in being marked by the Spirit, having the Spirit upon you, and in being led by the Spirit is that when you are led by the Spirit, all of that energy of the Spirit, all of that power of the Spirit enables you to accomplish work that you would not have been able to do otherwise. It's not just about having it present. It's about actually moving in it, operating in it, being energized by it, and accomplishing something for the kingdom because of it. So when you live a spirit-led life, let's look at, at some things that, that happen in Simeon's life that'll show us how to live a spirit-led life. So if you want to be, live a life that's led by the spirit and not just marked or sealed by the spirit, and the first thing you'll realize is that he orders your steps. He orders your steps. When you live a spirit-led life, he will order your steps if you'll submit to him. Now, Simeon may not have planned to go to the temple that day. Do you, you realize that? Uh, it doesn't say, the scripture doesn't say how long ago God told him you are not going to die until you see the Messiah. It might have been a few weeks. It might have been a few years. And here's this old man that's been living every day of his life since he was given that prophecy. And I'm sure the first few weeks or maybe even a few months, he went to the temple every day and he's studying, he's staring, he's trying to find a kid that looks like the Messiah because that's been his promise. But at some point, you got to go back to life as normal, right? You got to get stuff done. You got to go about your daily life. And you, you, you realize that you have no idea when that's going to happen. And so you go back to normal. But that day, the Spirit led him to go to the temple. When you live a Spirit led life, you realize that you don't, there are no coincidences in your life, there are only God incidences. That nothing happens to you by accident. When you, when you live a spirit-led life, you learn to listen to the nudges. You learn to listen to that voice that, that maybe you haven't noticed before, or maybe that's not part of your typical routine. You, you, ever, been, you ever felt that nudge to do something a little differently? That you, something's, just, something's just urging you to go a different direction. Go down a different road. Make a different choice than you usually make. You know, talk to somebody that you don't normally talk to. You just feel that urge. You just feel that nudge. You have got to learn to listen to the voice of the Spirit. Learn to pay attention to those feelings. Pay attention to those urges. You say, well, John, so every time I get an urge to do something, that's the Spirit talking to you? No. Sometimes that's Taco Bell. Which if you care about yourself, you probably shouldn't eat like I do. But not every voice is the voice of the Spirit. But you have got to learn to listen to the voice of the Spirit. You will never learn to discern His voice until you pay attention to the voices. You say, well, John, what if, what if I listen and I feel like it's God, but I'm not sure and I do, and I do something that's not God? Well, so what? You were going to do something without God anyway. You, you're, sometimes you're just going to do stuff because it's just stuff. So w why not take the chance on you might have actually heard from, from, from the Lord and you may actually accomplish a kingdom purpose when otherwise it would have just been an ordinary day. It, God is not sitting on the throne waiting on you to mess up so he can zap you. He, he is not, that's Greek mythology, that's Zeus. That's not our father. He sits on the throne hoping that you're going to make a choice to listen to his voice. He's coaching you. He's urging you. He's not mad at you. He's just disappointed for you when you, when you don't hear his voice. He's encouraged and he loves it when you hear and when you choose to follow his voice. He said, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. But you have to develop that. You have to learn to be able to discern between, to discern between your soul and your spirit. You have to learn to, to know when it's God talking to you and when it's your, your own flesh or when it's another voice or when it's, or when it's bad tacos. You've got to learn how to discern all of that stuff, but you never will until you try. You never will until you, until you start paying attention and recognize his voice. Remember the prophet Samuel in the Old Testament laying as a, as a child, laying on the bed, the voice of God speaks audibly. And he hears it, but he does three times, but he doesn't know it's God. It took, it took Eli to say, hey, kid, you're hearing the voice of God. That's the voice of the Father. You need to mark that voice when you hear it. The next time that speaks, you need to do that, whatever he says. We have to do the same thing in our lives. We've got to train ourselves to hear the voice of the Spirit if we're going to be Spirit-led. 
Here's the second thing. So he orders our steps. The second thing is this. He positions you for destiny. When you're spirit-led, he will position you for destiny. Let me ask you this question. What would have happened if Simeon had not listened to the spirit that day? What would have happened if he said, another day of waiting on the Messiah, he's not coming. I, that's not, that cannot be God. I, I, it's just me. I'm just wanting. I'm old. I'm ready to go. And I want to see, see this thing that God says coming to pass, but it's, t- it's like Tuesday. It can't, that prophecy could not possibly be, be fulfilled on Tuesday. So what if he'd have just gone about his business? You, you do realize that just because you've been given a destiny, first of all, do you believe that every one of us has a destiny and a calling of God upon our lives? That, that God has, has plans for us every day He has plans for us? How many of you would be willing to admit that you may have missed one or two of those days of plans? Just, I mean, just once or twice. Just because it's God's will for you and God's destiny for you and God's plan for you does not mean you're going to fulfill it. We have a part to play. We have choices to make. He has given us a destiny, but we sometimes make choices that begin to take us off that track. Now, in His grace and in His mercy, He allows us to make other choices that that can sometimes realign us with His destiny and with His purpose. But not everything we do is God's fault. Not every choice we make is what God wanted us to make. You under, you, you, is that just me, or y'all okay? You understand? Not, you can't blame everything on God. Well, God made me choose that. No, he didn't. You did that on your own. James said sometimes we get, we get drawn away by our own lusts and enticed, and we fall into sin. And, and God can never tempt someone to sin. And if you're making a choice that takes you off the path to his destiny for you, then, then that's sin in your life, and that's not God's deal. Simeon had a choice to make, and if we will li- learn to listen to the voice of God, he will position us for our destiny. Because he heard the voice of God and showed up at the temple that day, then God had him in the right place at the right time, and he saw his destiny fulfilled right in front of him. How many times have we blown right past what the Spirit's trying to say and do in our lives that may have been the key. It may have been the answer to what God had planned for us, the answer to what we've prayed for. And God said, hey, it's right over there. And we just... So God's like, well, okay. (laughs) Let me try this again. And he moves it a little further on the path because of his grace. If it was us, what what would you say to somebody else? If you said, hey, the answer's right there, and they just went blowing past you, you said, Psh, you ain't getting that. Right back in your pocket, right? I told you. You ain't got sense enough to get it. Did y'all's parents tell y'all stuff like that? <laughs> you got sense enough to eat at dinner time. you just go to bed hungry. Fortunately, God is not the kind of father that I am <laughs> or that you are. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> There's a little shouting moment. Y'all can do a little jig on that. God ain't nothing like John. Hallelujah. In his grace, he picks that up and he says, well, maybe next time they'll hear me. Places it there again in his, in his infinite mercy. He, when we live a spirit-led life, he orders our steps and he, and he positions us for destiny, but he also confirms to us what he's promised us. Simeon got there. Look, can I tell you something that might surprise you? Jesus is not the little pasty white guy that you see on all the drawings. He was a Jewish dude from the Middle East. He probably a little dark skin. His parents were a little dark skin. You know, if you lined him up with all the other babies that were born on his birthday, I don't think you would have just been able to walk up and go, now that's a Messiah-looking kid right there. He just looked like an eight-day-old Jewish kid. How in the world did Simeon know that was him? I mean, it wasn't like he was carrying a, uh, he wasn't wrapped in a blanket that had Messiah printed on it. It went monogram with like Jesus or Son of God or whatever. He didn't know. How did he know? The same Spirit that promised him that he would see the Messiah before he died. The same Spirit that led him to the temple that day. The same Spirit that got him in the right place at the right time also confirmed for him this is the moment. This is the guy. This is your destiny. This is the one that that I promised you would see. 
He was living a spirit-led life. And when you are led by, your, by the Spirit of God, then he will get you in the right place and will make sure you know you're in the right place at the right time. Have you ever just needed to know from God that you were in the right spot? <laughs> it is amazing how much we can tolerate, how much abuse, how, much, how many difficult days we can tolerate if we know that we know that we know that we're in the right spot, that we're exactly where God wants us to be. And, and we, may not have, we not, may not be happy about it, but we have a joy that resides within us that says, I, I'm going to get through this because this is where God wants me to be. We have a peace that rests upon us because we know we're where God wants us to be. So he will, he will order your steps and he'll position you right and then he'll confirm that you're in the right spot at the right moment in your life. That's what living a spirit-led life does for you. Now let's look at, a, at another person in this, in this uh, story, this account of Christmas, and find out what else, how else the spirit of Christmas permeates everything that, that happened there. In Luke chapter 1, verse 39, a few days later, Mary, and this is after Mary received the announcement that she was going to be carrying Jesus, and we'll see that in a moment. She hurried to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zechariah lived and entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. Now, Zechariah and Elizabeth are the parents of John the Baptist. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Not that she was led by the Holy Spirit. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. There is a difference between living a life as a follower of Jesus where the Spirit of God is upon you as one of His children and, and in living a life where you are led by His Spirit. But then there is also a difference in living a, a life where you are led by His Spirit and a life where you are filled with His Spirit. Elizabeth was filled. It wasn't that she just recognized she was in the right place at the right time. When she heard Mary's voice, then, then she was filled with the Spirit. And the next thing, if you read the rest of the verses, the next thing that comes out of her mouth is praise for God. It's recognition that God's moving and that God's, that God's doing something in their lives. So when you are filled with the Spirit, you cannot help but praise God for what He's done in your life, for what He's doing in your life, and for what He's doing all around you. You can't help but be filled with joy. A lot of people have a hard time at the, at, in the holiday season. Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, I have a hard time finding any joy. Something about the seasons, something about the time of the year, something about the connection to memories or to expectations, whatever it is, but it just saps the joy right out of things for a lot of people. And there's a lot of reasons, so I'm not, I don't want to oversimplify this, but let me tell you, if you are struggling to find joy, and maybe not just during Christmas, maybe every day of your life, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. He brings joy. He is joy. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, like Elizabeth did, she was beside herself, so to speak, with joy at, the, at, at how awesome God is that He gives her the chance to be in that moment. She recognized that something's going on here bigger than me, and I'm just blessed to be here. You ever just glad to be a fly on the wall somewhere? You just experience something. I mean, like, like this morning, uh, hearing you all worship. I just folded my little arms, and I just shut my little mouth, and I just listened to y'all worship. And I was just glad to be here. Honored to be in the presence of God's people worshiping Him in one mind, in one accord. Elizabeth had that experience there. She was filled with joy at what God was doing. If you're struggling to find that joy, be filled with the Spirit. If you're struggling, you're discouraged because you don't see God working around you the way you think you should, be filled with His Spirit. When, when Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit, she recognized, hey, God's up to something. God's doing stuff. 
I thought I was by myself. I thought I was on my own, but God is moving everywhere, all around me. When you're filled with his spirit, the Bible says deep calls out to deep. The, the, the spirit connects with the Holy Spirit wherever he is and wherever he's around you. And so you just your spirit starts bearing witness with, with what's going on around you. You recognize that God's moving over here and God's doing something over here and God's convicting people over here and God's blessing people over here. And you just recognize the greatness of God. When you allow yourself to be filled with the Spirit. Here's another passage in, in, in chapter 1. In verse 59, this talks about Zechariah, the birth of John the Baptist, and, and what happened with Zechariah. When the baby was eight days old, they came from, for the circumcision ceremony. They want, this is, again, this is John the Baptist. They wanted to name him Zechariah after his father, but Elizabeth said, No, his name's John. What? They exclaimed. There's no one in all your family by that name. So he motioned, so they used gestures to ask the baby's father what he wanted to name him, and he motioned for a writing tablet because he'd been, he'd been struck mute because of his unbelief that John was actually going to be born. And he wrote, to everyone's surprise, his name, I love this, his name is John. He ain't talking about this. He's not planning to carry on this conversation. That boy right there is John, period. Instantly, Zechariah could speak again, and he began praising God. And in verse 67, it, it expands a little further. It says this, in verse 67, Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. And then he began to prophesy. He began to speak about the things that the Lord is doing. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you will speak what he says to speak when he says to speak it, you will say what the Lord tells you to say in that moment. He will give you the strength. He will give you the courage. He will give you the words. He will, he will teach you to be obedient. When you're filled with the Spirit, you get obedient. You, you realize that Isaiah, I just, it just hit me out of the blue a few weeks ago. Isaiah, when the Lord said, who, who will go for us and whom can I, will I send? Isaiah said, ooh, ooh, here I am, pick me. He didn't even know what he was saying yes to. But he was filled. It was the next verse that he said, oh good, you're going to Israel. You're going to, tell them, uh, you're going to preach to them stuff they don't want to hear. It'll be awesome. They'll hate you. <laughs> It'll be awesome. Thanks for saying yes. Good job. Way to volunteer. When you, but he was overwhelmed in the presence of God. Isaiah stepped into the throne room of God in this vision, and he was overwhelmed by the Spirit of God. And, and the, when you're filled with the Spirit of God, you just say yes. When God says, will you, you just say yes, and then you say, will I what? After you say yes. You get obedient when you're full of the Spirit. You'll even do the unconventional when you're full of the Spirit. Everybody else in the family, nobody in the family is named John. And Zechariah says, that boy's name's John. Uh, despite what the family said, despite what tradition said, when, when, when God calls you to do something and he fills you with, your, with, with his spirit, then you do even what other people say you can't do because he called you to it. So you do it. You do what even other people say you shouldn't do. If he called you to it, then you do it because you're filled with his spirit. Are you, are you struggling I'm spitting everywhere. I'm glad Steve and Julie are down here taking the hit for all y'all. Y'all going to drown. Are you struggling with what God says in your life? Are you struggling to do what he's called you to do? Are, are you afraid to speak the truth in those moments when you know you should, but everything within you tells you not to? Are you struggling to be the witness that God called you to be? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what he's given to us for. We shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes upon us. I have a couple that joined the church a few weeks ago, and, and they make it a habit of when, a, when they're in a restaurant, a server comes to the table, and they say, in just a minute, we're going to bless our, we're going to pray and, and bless our food. Is there anything that we can pray with you about? I mean, isn't that cool? Isn't that, that'd be easy even for introverts like us, right? That's a great, it's a great thing to develop. And, and I'm sure sometimes people just blow that off, and sometimes people just say, yeah, 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 pray for my granny or whatever. But, but in this, this week, this couple did this, and this lady said, oh, yes, Lord, please pray for my family. And she stood there, and she held hands with the family and prayed with them in the restaurant. And so 
as when she brought the bill back to the table, um, she left a note in it. And it did not say, your meal is on the house today. So y'all stop that. <laughs> You're going to charge out to the Cracker Barrel and pray with the first waitress you could find, hoping that God would give you a free meal. That is not how that always works. <laughs> they, as far as I know, they had to pay for their meal, okay? Well, get that out of the way. But she left a note in there. And she said, people like you are what gets me through. I'm having a hard time with my family. I'm struggling. Stuff going on. But your prayers from people like you are what gets me through. Thank you for being godly people. That's being salt and light. That's being a spirit-filled person. Where, where in the moment, because some of you are like, oh, Lord, I'm terrified. I, I, I can't, my mouth just went dry thinking about going out to eat next time. I get it. I understand that. And maybe he doesn't lead you to do that. But if he does, you've got to be willing to do that. Where, where is that going to come from? It comes from this oasis of the Spirit. When you are filled with the Spirit, Jesus said, rivers of living water will flow from you. So when you're filled, you will never run dry of the source of power and courage and strength. Now here's the, here's the, last, uh, the last guy that is filled with the Spirit is John the Baptist. And, 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 and in the interest of time, let me just tell you that the prophecy when Zechariah was told that he was going to have John the Baptist, he said and he's going to be filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb. From the beginning, he will be filled with the Spirit. And then after John was born, Jesus said, there's never been a greater man that's ever walked the planet than John the Baptist. He said he's the cream of the crop. Doesn't get better than John the Baptist. How is that? Because he was filled with the Holy Spirit from day one dedicated himself to pursuing the call and destiny of God on his life. It, because Zechariah and Elizabeth were old, were at least older than your conventional parents in that time, it is believed that they passed away early in his life. And John left the, the comforts of, of his hometown and went into the wilderness and he studied and he prayed and he prepared himself for the call of God. And when he turned 30, he burst on the scene and he turned the culture of Israel upside down with his call to repentance and, be, and being baptized for the remission of sin. How do, you get that, how do you get that focus on doing what God called you to do? How do you get that focus on the things of the kingdom? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Not just having the Spirit upon you, not just, not just being led by the Spirit, but being filled with the Spirit. Here's the last way that the spirit of Christmas is involved in this story and is involved, wants to be involved with us. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 26, the, the angel comes to, to Mary and says this, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to marry a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. And Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. <laughs> she was confused and disturbed. Mary tried to think what the angel could possibly mean, and he said this, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his, father, of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And then Mary says this, But how can this happen? I'm a virgin. Not, not a question of doubt, simply a point of order. <laughs> the angel replied, I want you to pay attention to this. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High, which is the Holy Spirit, will overshadow you so that the baby born will be holy, and he'll be called the Son of God. The angel promised Mary that the Holy Spirit would overshadow her. The Amplified Version says he will envelop her like a cloud. Do you understand that there's a difference in being led by the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit? And then there is another thing entirely to be wrapped in the Spirit. To be Spirit wrapped. What do you see when you look under a Christmas tree and you see gifts there? What do we, what do, we do? We, we wrap those gifts, right? Don't, don't y'all? Are you like my sister that puts it in the Walmart bag and says, there it is, you want some? 
Very practical woman, my sister. When you, when, when you see a gift that's wrapped, all you can see is the paper. You don't know what's on the inside. You wrap it so that the contents will disappear. And what's on the inside is not visible from the outside. When you live a life that is wrapped in the Holy Spirit, then you're doing exactly what John the Baptist said. He said, you have to decrease and God has to increase. That's how that happens. And when that, when that continues to happen, then, then the Holy Spirit wraps you up. Paul said, you need to put on, I think it's in Colossians, you need to put on Christ. You need to put him on like a robe, like a mantle that wraps around you. When you wrap yourself in the Spirit of God, then they don't see what, what's on the inside. They only see Christ. They don't, they don't know what's, what's in here. They only realize that the wrapping is Jesus. You know, in Corinth... 2,000 years ago, they called them Christians for the first time. And we talked about it in the last series. Christian means little Christ. They were little Christ because they were literally wrapped up with the Spirit of God. They, they said, man, he looks different than Jesus looked, but it's the same Spirit. Looks the same from the outside. Same stuff's happening. The same love is coming out. Same Spirit's coming out. They, they, they were wrapped in the Spirit of Christ. We have to be the same thing. We have to be wrapped in the Spirit of Christ. And when we are then it produces a peace that doesn't that passes understanding. Do you realize that Mary was in a mess? Right? She was in a situation that was difficult. She was about to be she was about to be set aside in her marriage. She's going to be he, Joseph was going to break up with her or or should have, could have going to break up with her. She was going to lose status in the community. She was going to be frowned upon. She might have been thrown out of her family. She, there were all kinds of bad things that were happening to Mary. But when you see, you read the, the Magnificat at the end of Luke chapter 1, Mary's song of praise to the Lord for what he's doing in her life, you don't see any concern or worry in that girl. She is praising God for what he's doing and seems to have perfect peace about what's about to happen. If you need that kind of peace in your life, then you need to sub ask the Lord to wrap you in himself, wrap you in his presence, wrap you in his spirit. That's where peace comes from. Being spirit-wrapped. Actually, every level of your relationship with the spirit comes from submission. It comes from you surrendering another part of yourself another piece of you, another piece of your will, another piece of, your, uh, of the sin that may be in your life, the disobedience in your life. It just comes one by one by one. As you surrender to the Lord, He wraps you up greater and greater. And here's the last thing about being spirit-wrapped that I want to make sure you understand. And Jeff, why don't you guys come on? Mary said, hey, I can't have a baby because I'm a virgin, which is literally true. Physically in the natural, that is true. Never been with a man, I can't have a baby. God, the answer that God provided to her is this. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. The Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you. He's going to wrap you up. He's going to envelop you. I want you to understand that when you are wrapped in His Spirit, when you're led by His Spirit, and then you are filled with His Spirit on the inside, and then He wraps you in His Spirit, every obstacle falls away. Every limitation gets exceeded. Every, every roadblock has to go away. Everything that would limit you from doing what God called you to do is taken away because He has wrapped you up. He has literally permeated every crack, every crevice, every insecurity, every inadequacy, every weakness, everything that, that you think makes you unqualified to do what he called you to do. When he fills you and then he wraps you, then he fills in everything that's lacking in yourself. And so there is nothing that he calls you to do that when he wraps you up, you're not able to do. So I can't is really a cop-out. When you recognize the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, the power that is available to us if we ask, then, then you realize that I can't is really I don't want to. Or I'm afraid to. 
or I don't know how to. But He's given us His power to fill us and to lead us and to wrap us. And if we'll surrender to that today, then we'll walk in the spirit of Christmas. Not just during this season, but every day of our lives. And while we may not be involved in these earth-shattering, history-changing situations like these folks were, it'll change your life. It'll change the lives of the people that are around you. And at the end of the day, that's all we can ask for. Why don't you stand with me, please? There is a spirit of Christmas that has nothing to do with gifts or toys or trees. Spirit of Christmas is the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you this. How much of the Spirit are you allowing to operate in you on a daily basis? Would you? Where would you put yourself on this continuum? Would you say, I've I'm, I'm just got the Spirit on me because I'm His child? Would you move towards being led by the Spirit, listening to His voice, doing what He says to do? Or maybe you've been doing that for a long time. You say, John, it's just not enough. I know there's something deeper. There's something that I want, that, that God wants me to do more than this. Then would you, would you seek Him and ask Him to fill you with His Spirit? Or maybe you've been, you've been filled with the Spirit for a long time. And you say, John, I still... Uh, man, I, there's so much to do and I just feel so inadequate. Would you just ask him to wrap you up? There will never, there's no one here who has arrived. There's no one here who is as fully wrapped and fully filled and fully everything as you need to be. So I'm just asking you right now in the presence of God to just allow him to search you and to sh show you the truth about yourself. And then just take the chance to move deeper and closer in, in your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would search us. God, reveal truth about ourselves to us. And God, I pray that we would be, that every person here would take the next step. Every person would take the next step in deepening and widening and broadening their relationship with you. Because we've got kingdom work to do. We've got lives that need to be changed. We've got souls that need to be saved. And we can't do it on our own. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And may we, every day, in ever-increasing amounts, learn to surrender our lives to your Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.